Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be here. Thank you to our staff for asking me. Uh, you may hear better speakers than me, but you're not going to hear from many with more titles than me. <laughs> um, I just use the slides as a prompt. I don't have a script. I hate it when people stand in front of me and read from a script. Uh, this is quite risky if you're suffering from jet lag, and I did have one Singapore swing last night, I have to say. I've heard this style of presentation described by an American di diplomat as being a textual deviant. Now, you don't want to say that if you've had more than one Singapore swing. Uh, Hannibal Great, apparently, when he was in exile, was taken to a lecture by a so-called expert, and at the end of it, he said, in my time, I had to listen to some old fools, but this one beats them all. <laughs> Hopefully, you will not go away from here this afternoon with that impression. But what I can tell you is what we're trying to do at Exeter is if it is possible to learn the lessons from our experience, we're trying to look back over uh, what we as a British military, the British political establishment have done in the last decade and ask ourselves what did we do wrong and how, how might we equip the next generation to do things better. Um, that's my topic. Uh, I was in Iraq on and off between 2003-2008 for a total of about 14 months. And I'm going to use Iraq as the backdrop, and then I'm going to talk about three particular characters, all of whom I served under. But what I'm talking about, of course, is quite sensitive in a way, so this is not history, but these are my personal reflections, and take them for that. Some of it may be a tad contentious. What I'm hoping is that it will stimulate some good discussion, not just questions and answers. Uh, of course, whenever someone stands in front of you, they should declare their bias. We all have bias. I was a supporter, originally, of the Iraq War. Uh, I put my shoulder to the wheel as best I could. I think history will look unkindly at my generation and those perhaps slightly more senior, slightly older than me. They will be harsh in their judgment. And so, as happens as you get a little older, you become thoughtful about your reputation. So in my final tour in Baghdad, I was working on this project doing insurgent outreach. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I uh, went down to this gathering with the man on the right there is General John Allen just hanging over the command in Afghanistan, and the man on the left is a tribal sheikh in the Mali. And having given this interview to the, to the Telegraph newspaper, uh, at General Petraeus's request, because I hate giving interviews, the following week, I went for a meeting with a, a leader of the self-styled honorable resistance in a neighboring country. This was the leader of an insurgent group. And he said, General, we really liked your interview make you think, because, of course, the power of communication now means that whatever we say to one audience, and this will resonate with Bernard, who's interested in strategic communication, reaches audiences in strange places. It also made me think a little later what my obituary might be like. Yeah. Admiral Lord Nelson, the hero of Trafalgar. General Bernard Law Montgomery, the victor of El Alamein. General Paul Newton, surprisingly popular with his enemies. <laughs> <laughs> Getting to Iraq in 2003 and then in 2004 reminded me of the stories of my father, who was with the British Army in May 1940 in France, said it felt like. It's this idea of tempo. Whatever you're doing is relative to the problem you face. And what happened to the British in 1940 was happening to us in the coalition in 2003-2004. I would argue right the way through to about mid-2007. This notion, and this is a quote from someone in 1940, if only we could just stop for 24 hours to get, to get ourselves together. And this is not just a military problem. Many of you here are not going to be from the military, but you will be involved in strategic decision making in your own fields. I was talking to a British lawyer in London a couple of weeks ago. He'd been at Enron on the day that that company collapsed. He said it was a really good company. Rather than the company was sky high. There was a real corporate sense of belonging. 
And on the day that the collapse happened, some people were unscrewing the television sets from the lobby and stealing them, and others were walking around like zombies in shock. Now, being in business or in military matters or in politics, you cannot prevent surprise. Surprise is going to happen to you. It's how you deal with surprise and whether or not surprise becomes catastrophic shock. I certainly felt, as a member of the headquarters in 2004, that we were in a state of shock. Uh, you can't get away without a definition. And I think there are probably more definitions of strategy, this much used and abused word, than there are even of terrorism. What I did is I went back here and looked at the root of it, the notion of an army spread out from the Greek. Of course, back until the Industrial Revolution, uh, armies were the biggest human organization, the biggest organism that had to be controlled. So there's something about generalship from military strategy that still resonates with those of you who are not in the military today. Something that is now so far spread out that it takes a particular kind of leadership as well as the tools of control to get it directed. And therefore, the role of a leader is to lead. It's to find the ways in the typical construct of strategy defined as ends, ways, and means. Particular focus among the strategic leadership elites on finding the ways, the twist, if you like. Creating choices, purposeful action, taking calculated risks. Not, as is often said about strategy, it's a plan. The plan is not the strategy. Well, military strategy is about warfare, and in 2003, uh, the way of warfare, the shock and awe in particular, worked extremely well. But of course, war is about politics. It's about what you want to achieve after the violence is over. And here, and although I put it in quotes, uh, it was reported speech, so I can't promise you that General Tommy Franks said these exact words, but the sentiment in 2003, as this war was being planned, was one of the military preparing to do the day, the shock and all, to achieve the effect. And what happened after that was based on a whole series of flawed assumptions that the military uh, was some divorced from. So the race to Baghdad, this audacious, terribly well executed, risk uh, topples the regime. But that does not create the political conditions that were expected. And so the mission of a new political order was left hanging in the air. Why? Well, I'm not blaming people like Ahmed Chaudhry. I think you know, many of us are culpable for the catastrophic miscalculation of the state of affairs inside Iraq and what would happen after we had toppled the regime. But this inability to understand uh, set the conditions, the challenges, for the three people that I'm going to talk about. Because instead of a viable political order, instead of a neat decapitation and being able to hand over authority relatively quickly to a functioning political and administrative entity, you have a political vacuum, Quite quickly, the United Nations are bombed out, and along with them get most of the diplomatic community. And what you're left with was a mainly American military that had been superbly crafted to fight wars of the revolution in military affairs era. Not to do nation building, not to do counterinsurgency. So the first person that I worked for was General Rick Sanchez. I worked for him only for about two months. And by the time I arrived, things were going badly wrong. A Texan by birth, the son of allegedly a hard-drinking Mexican welder, the classic American self-made man. He had uh, forged his way to a position of well-deserved authority in the American military. At the time that he was sent to Baghdad, he had been commanding American troops in Germany. Like most of us, he had little or no understanding of the Middle East in general, or Iraq specifically. He was an armored warfare expert. He's wearing three stars on his collar, and he was the most junior American three-star general, who was then taken from Germany and put with an ad hoc staff, of which I was part, 
into that vacuum, that political cauldron. He is, I believe, the only retired American three-star officer not to have a seat on a major corporate board in retirement, which gives you some idea of the effect that Iraq has had on him personally. And it seems that because strategy is a collaborative effort, you need to have friends in court. And General Sanchez had not been serving inside the Beltway. He did not appear to have that ability to communicate with the political elite that were running the Cheney, the Wolfowitzes, the Rumsfelds, who were running the Iraq agenda. So the problem was defined by Washington as we're dealing with dead enders, we're dealing with criminals. It's just a criminal vacuum. Whereas instead, what was happening was something much more profound. And it's the job, of course, of the leader to be able to bridge, to be able to speak effectively truth to power. And I think confidence by the time I arrived, confidence in this particular leader was ebbing fast. Not helped by the fact that the team that was put together was about the most toxic that you could imagine. Uh, Ambassador Bremer, hugely confident, very assertive, given the job of running Iraq in the Coalition Provisional Authority. But the partnership between them was toxic in the extreme. I mean, the morning briefings in the old Republican palace were a mixture of theatre and blood sports. It was the most incredible atmosphere. And as a result of this, as a result of the inability of those at the top to create unity of purpose, you had different communities springing up within the organization. Fragmentation, not cohesion. Some of us, and I was involved in this right on the periphery, were involved in talking to some of the militia leaders in a place called Sala City. We could not report that back in to our political masters because the ideology was, we don't talk to those guys. Hardly the unity of purpose that is required. And then, in that funny old way, tactical becomes strategic. Now, could anyone have done a better job than General Sanchez, given the hand that he was built? Bearing in mind that the ends were unclear and shifting, the ways were also unclear because it was anathema to say in mid 2004 that we're dealing with insurgency and given the means at his disposal, which included, for instance, a very high proportion of army units that were playing, as we would say, out of position. They weren't doing what they'd been trained for, they were running detention centers, many of them reservists who had no role in training. But Sanchez takes some culpability for this because he authorized the methods of interrogation, although not this sort of humil humiliation. But when something like this happens to you, if you're an honorable, decent man, then that is a personal shock as well. So by the time that I was working for him, we're dealing here with a general who is withdrawing into himself, who is surrounded by a quite unusual clique of people who may have thought it was their job to protect him from what was going on. Uh, you may think this is an unfair image, but it, it, it sums up to me the body language, if you like, of Rick Sanchez by this time. Look at the faces, look at the body language of the American soldiers to whom he's talking. Uh, every morning there would be an update, a huge update, with maybe 200 slides, PowerPoint slides. And General Sanchez would sit there with his shoulders hunched and just go, next, next, next. And there is a point here that it is the job of the leader, no matter what he's doing on the inside, to communicate confidence, a glimmer of confidence and hope. General Eisenhower, after an amazing setback to the American military in the early days of the North African campaign, talks about this and says that he would never, ever allow his manner or his expression his voice, the way he behaved outwardly, to show the inner self-doubt. By the time General Sanchez is leaving Iraq, the headquarters is a bunch, including me, of middle-aged, 
to exhaust these men trying to make sense of events. And here's what the arithmetic of chaos looks like in terms of our own true casualties. <coughs> so the second officer under whom I had the privilege to serve is General George Casey. A very different man in terms of background, the son of a major general who was killed in a helicopter crash while serving in Vietnam. I believe he went to Georgetown University. Uh, five years older than Sanchez, one star more senior already, and in the previous three years had been holding key appointments in the Pentagon, and so was therefore connected to those back at the other end of the video conference. Recognized immediately on arriving in Iraq that they were dealing with an insurgency, said, where's the campaign plan? He scratched around, he couldn't find a campaign plan, so he said, right, we're going to write a campaign plan and understood that the problem was one of insurgency. Not a showman, not a showy general, but calm and resilient. If I had to sum up his approach, it would be that he is a great organizer. After this, he went on to be chief of staff of the army, and in an army of 1.1 million men, I think that was probably his forte, at being able to organize complex, big organizations. But those of you who understand business strategy will recognize the term deliberate strategy. Emphasis <laughs> on order and the campaign plan. Partnered by a highly competent American diplomat called Ambassador Nicole Ponte, they made a very strong team. But of course, strategic leaders get the big ideas right. And I think there are a number of the big ideas that history now tells us were dubious or potentially very flawed. General Casey's theory throughout his two and a half years, think of the resilience of that. You're there in Baghdad for two and a half years. His idea was based around the idea that the Iraqis will always fight against occupation, so we need to get the coalition forces out of the spotlight and build as quickly as we can on an industrial scale Iraqi security forces because, and this is a direct quote, I was in the meeting, Iraqis won't fight Iraqis. A huge cultural mistake that none of us corrected at the time, because Iraqis were just groaning for the chance to settle old scores. Multiple conflicts going on now that we had removed the man and the regime that kept them submerged. Because the Iraqi security forces that we were then building in an industrial way were sectarian. Bremer had debarthified and had sacked most of those who had served the previous regime, we were now busy hiring people from the competing sect. The other observation I make about this style of strategic leadership is it is uh, what is described by some as single loop learning. So quite early in General Casey's time there, we were asked to come up with plans for doing cities. Which city should we do next? Should it be Ramadi or Fallujah? And the idea that we're going to go in and clean them out, that we're going to clear them. Now I've spent and more than 20 years of my life going to and from to Northern Ireland knowing that against a much lesser threat you never actually clear a city if the insurgency is rooted within the community. So what we're doing here at this stage of the campaign, we're grouping our way towards a strategy with some good ideas and some that are fundamentally flawed. Another of General Casey's ideas was we've got to get a drumbeat out there, good news. Schools are open. Clinics have been refurbished. Now, I then went and did it because I was in strategic plans and assessment. I then went to the office that was producing all of these statements, and I discovered that in a room as big as this, with more people than we've got in it now, not one of them writing these press releases could speak or read Arabic. And in a briefing that I will remember the day I die, I said to General Casey, General, the problem is you haven't got the drum. You could sort of see this wave of bodies moving away from the, the chap who's now spoken this, this unspoken, unspeakable truth that one of the central ideas is not going to work because ends, ways, you haven't got the means. What we were dealing with by this stage, and we were starting to become aware of it, 
is a mosaic of insurgency that is constantly changing. And this is a picture taken from about 2007. This is not the task that the American military had set out to prepare itself for, nor was it the task the British army had prepared itself for. Enshramani does have a strategy. Zarkar uh, gives his allegiance to Al-Qaeda, and his strategy is really very simple. He is going to commit atrocity after atrocity, blowing up markets and so forth, that will goad the majority Shia into a violent reaction that will, quote, awaken the sleeping Sunnis, unquote. So that's his strategy. He's going to exploit those fault lines in Iraqi society that we were unaware of in order to get a counteraction. And just when you think things can't get any worse, they can. Uh, Al-Qaeda blow up the second most sacred Shia shrine in Samarra, and now he gets what he's been after. And the Sunni, including lots of members of the security forces that we've been creating, sweep through areas like Baghdad, murdering, ethnically cleansing. We, meanwhile, are mis mis misunderstanding the motive and the support of people like this man, Muqtadr al-Sadr, and his militia, the Jaysh al-Mahdi. So, here you have a retired British general, busy criticizing a whole bunch of Americans. We're the experts in counterinsurgency, or so we like to think. What's going on down in the south? Well, down in the south, our notions that we took from Northern Ireland are just not working. And over time, we become strategically unbalanced in that the military realized we don't have the forces needed to do the job, nor do we have the mandate to control the South. That our tolerance of our, our presence is diminishing rapidly, yet due to our grand strategic special relationship in our terms, relationship with the United States, we're fixed there. That's our paradox. That's our dilemma. We're stuck on the horns of a dilemma. Now, when you're involved in a coalition and you're talking at times when you're very, very tired and you're under stress, clarity is absolutely essential. Whether you're in business, talking to business partners from a different culture, or you're in a military situation. So we have this huge uprising going on. We're now fighting on all fronts. And every evening, General Casey is having a conference call with his divisional commanders. And they're coming up on the net, and they're reporting in what has happened during the day. You have the US Marine Corps, you have American divisional commanders, and then you get to the British. And I was sitting in there in Baghdad when this phrase came over the radio. Uh, it's been another sticky day in the South. And Americans are looking at one another. Presumably they're talking about the weather. Another sticky, humid day in the South. Well, let me show you very briefly what a sticky day in the South looked like. And bear in mind, this is 2004, long before wearing helmet cameras and so forth became so prevalent. This is not Northern Ireland. This is my old battalion, one PWR in a place called Talamara. Forgive me. <laughs> Because the British weren't explaining clearly what it was they were up against, the reputation of the British Army is becoming undermined and damaged. 
and there are influential people in Washington who think we're incapable and unwilling to fight. We weren't expressing ourselves clearly. So one of the qualities that I particularly admire in this man is resilience. I never saw him lose his temper. I never saw, despite wave after wave of bad news, the visible sign that his morale was shaken. But I'm sure it was, because this is what losing looks like, graphically. This is uh, an Al-Qaeda graphic taken from Samara in about, I think, 2006, 2007. And the area shaded here, the Baghdad in the center, is what they say they're now in control of. Indeed, the US Marine Corps are saying they've lost control of the province of al -Anbar. And about this time, you have a grand strategic political choice being made in Washington. Do we accelerate the business of handing over to the Iraqis, or do we surge to reinforce? And there are reporting conversations between General Casey and President Bush that go along the lines of, are you trying to win or hand over? I think, again, confidence in General Casey now starts to ebb, and he, is, he comes back. He's not removed from command, but he comes back from Iraq rather earlier and is reported in Woodward's book as saying, during after the video conference where this happened, what the hell just happened? This notion that you can be a leader, you can have really good relationships, but what's happening at the other end? What's the atmospheric in head office? So, the third and final person in the case study. Uh, he happened to be the right man for this campaign, a man who is intrinsically comfortable in chaos. Ambitious, focused, a Princeton graduate, using a blend of control. How many tons of scrap metal have we lifted from the Euphrates this week, was one of the questions he would ask of his staff. A very close control, but also comfortable enough with events that he would allow them a certain amount of freedom. And between him and his highly successful partnership with Ambassador Ryan Crocker, they're able to put time on the clock they're able to communicate upwards based on deep knowledge of the region, Ambassador Crocker being a specialist in the Middle East, and Petraeus having served in Iraq on two previous occasions. They've viewed confidence, able to communicate downwards, to take complex ideas and express them very clearly, whatever field you're in, politics, business, the military. Getting the big ideas right, one of the big ideas being, this is about the population. If we can't secure the population, then we're not going to get on the front foot with the insurgency. We're, not, we're going to get out of our big bases and in and amongst the community. Active listening. I don't think that he's an easy listener. He's a very rigorous debater. He has strong ideas. But he will seek opinion from a wide range of sources and then form his own view. So what's going on here? Because he's going out and running with captains and majors and talking to them, that's where he credits the idea of local security as coming from. You go beyond single loop learning into double loop learning. Examining the things, even the things you think are going well, and challenging them. And then you can see the effect from the middle of 2007 on how Iraqi civilian casualties diminish. He's putting clock on the time, putting time on the clock for political progress. It helps if you can get the right team, General Stan McChrystal running special forces, relentlessly going after Al Qaeda, detaining <coughs> as well as killing, finding the twist, rapid exploitation, that being the key point in the detention operation. So that by the time Zarqawi is killed, I think the average age of cell leaders in Al-Qaeda has gone from around about 30 to 16. Even committed jihadists are realizing this is not a good career choice if you want to enjoy your pension. The other idea, we can't kill our way out of this, being able to go for novel solutions, forming strange organizations, of which I was a part. Highly talented American diplomat knew the region inside out, foreign area officer who also knew the region, a member of the Iraqi insurgency, and a rather younger looking me in Abu Ghraib. 
And the idea, expressed graphically, is this. What we're going to do is find the wedges, both in the Sunni insurgency and in the Shia insurgency. We're going to, through a, through a mixture of attrition and engagement, we're going to drive wedges in these problems. The government of Iraq, of course, sees this in rather different terms, so Petraeus and Crocker are constantly managing a very tense political relationship. And therefore, what we do is we do things like this. We take the deputy national security advisor out of Baghdad, down to Saudi Yusufir, south of Baghdad, and we get him to meet the 1920 Revolution Brigade cell leader who has done a deal with his American battalion commander two weeks before had been trying to kill him. The reason he's writing luminous vest is if he, quote, goes off the reservation, unquote, then he will be dealt with. So this is an accommodation. But we hire about 117,000 of these people in a bottom-up American units making this happen, enabled by Petraeus and Odierno in a bottom-up ship where we go from zero to about 117,000 in four months. And what are we doing? We're rehiring bits of the Ba'athist military establishment. And some of our Iraqi counterparts were saying to us, why would you have us take crocodiles as a pet? And our job as part of this strategy was to sell the crocodiles. So here's how strategy evolves under my three case studies. General Casey, deliberate strategy, build Iraqi security forces, here I'm simplifying for effect. Here we have the surge, where we both build Iraqi security forces and the American military surge as well. The strike operations being done by special forces and others. And then the flipping, where you take the insurgency, you drive wedges into it, and you separate it out. And of course what you've done now is if this guy is working for us, this guy is really one, because we might know where you live. Those are the figures that then show the military results of this strategy, building on what Casey had done with Petraeus and Crocker. And the analogy, that image, is what General Petraeus would use. That was what he was trying to do. Now think about this in terms of communication. Think about the picture. It is a American art, it's a, it's a point in their history of which you know, resonates with them. every American you're going to talk to, it's the Wild West, it's the stampede. But the beauty of this, as a metaphor, was we can't control events. The lightning's there, the thunder's there, the stampede is happening, and what we've got to do is keep it broadly on track. That is, in my experience, a unique application of all of the doctrine about risk-taking. It's what the business strategy calls emergent strategy. What does it achieve? Well, it achieves enough security for political space. It certainly achieves enough for a good order American withdrawal, but it means this man in charge, and therefore, is the mission accomplished? I think very much an open question. To finish, last slide, power of alliteration, for those of you who are not in the military, here are five observations, all beginning with C. And the first, of course, is we demand, we should demand competence in our leaders. Competence, not just in the science of their craft, but also the ability to innovate. They've got to be politically astute. They must be able to create the right climate, which often involves finding common ground. Strategic leaders, as opposed to managers, embrace complexity. Linear plans being much overrated. This notion of creative imagination, which if you don't have it, buy it in. And stick it into your machinery. As I've seen in Singapore with some of the horizon scan work. Chain. You really earn your pay when things are not going well. But you can prepare yourself and you can prepare others, so that you're not shocked, even though you will be surprised. And lastly, this absolutely <coughs> critical skill, it can be acquired, clear, concise, confident, all the time, up, down, and sideways. And so I take there my three 
snapshots of people that I was privileged to serve under. Privileged to serve under all three of them because they were good men doing the best they could under challenging times. And I leave you with the notion that the difference, perhaps, with the third was this notion of active listening, of having directed telescopes that would check even where things appear to be going well. Um, that concludes my overview of using Iraq as a metaphor for strategic leadership. I'd be really interested in your views as well as answering any questions to the best of my ability. Thank you.